What's up, everyone? Um, hi. So it's been I'm back, y'all. It's been a long time since I did a video for uh Raising Souls. Um, yeah. So I guess I'm, first of all, I guess I'm gonna give like a brief update on life since um my last video. So I got accepted to grad school, y'all. Um. I got accepted to all the schools that I applied to, and I just finished my first year, and I'm about to graduate next spring, so I'm excited for that. And yeah, you know, life has been life in. Um, so yeah, other than that, it's mainly been just school, family, friends, and everything of the sort. So that's pretty much how I. I, I didn't wasn't able to make time to like do re, um, leisure reading, so this is the first time I have been like actually done some reading since the last video. So we're finally back at it, and it's another quick book, which I I really appreciated about about this story. So and also I want to say. Thank y'all for the love that y'all been showing to this page. Um, I, I've been looking through the comments. Um, there was one person that said that they really appreciated um, the recording and the audio aspect of these videos because they're dyslexic. So that really meant a lot to me. So it got people get engaged into the stories. Um, so yeah, yes, of course there were some ne negative comments, but hey, that's what happens when you, <laughs> I guess you're actually saying something worth of um, saying. So um, yeah, my Michelle Wallace, um, Black Macho and the Myth of the Superwoman got 500 views. I'm like almost like half a thousand views. And I'm like, I didn't think people really know about this story know about this book like that but like i know michelle wallace is very known like back then but like wow like i, I guess for some i don't know how that video um was able to get the attraction that it got but i mean you, you, it should be an attraction it's about black feminism and stuff of, of things of that sort so i'm glad that um i'm getting a lot of positive feedback and people keep saying i love your videos keep keep doing it and stuff like that it's like uh and i it was and i'm not gonna lie y'all some some moments i was thinking about the living place because i'm like are people really watching these videos like that but people are did say that they appreciate it so i really um i'm really grateful for all of that so thank y'all once again so for this um, video, it's called um, Sexuality and the Black Church, A Womanist Perspective by Kelly Brown Douglas. For those who don't know who Kelly Brown Douglas is, she's a black feminist slash womanist theologian. So this is another of um, one of the liberation theology books that I've been reading, like James Cone and Dolores S. Williams. And Dolores S. Williams actually just passed away um, sometime last year. So it's, so, and I'm getting a lot, I'm getting, I got a lot of views from um, her book, Sisters in the Wilderness, which I'm also was appreciative of that. But it's like, yeah, it's like these story, these messages are still relevant to this day. And w what I appreciated about Kelly Brown Douglas is that she went into um, not just anti-blackness and um, sexism, she also went into homophobia and the sex and negative um, uh, messaging in the United States due to colonialism. So this is what this book is about. It's about uh, the United States and how it influenced the black church and its relationship with sexual sex and sexuality. Um, and not just to women in regards to sexual orientation, but also to gender and um, and sex politics and stuff like that. So let's get into it here. So for the introduction, um, she started off with um, how womanist theologians, um, they talk about um, race and gender when it comes to inclusion in, in um, religious spaces but there's an erasure of 
black sexuality and it's like how are we going to talk about black freedom and stuff like that if we're not talking about sexual liberation movements because um if it wasn't for sex we would not exist <laughs> so that's what um renee hill was um critiquing in some womanist spaces and Douglas also credited um, her cousin Lloyd, which is I would I, which is probably like the inspiration for this book. Her cousin Lloyd is um, um, a gay black man who she grew up with, and he died from AIDS. And this is I I don't know if this book's I'm not sure if this book was released during the like during the post. Um, epidemic of HIV and AIDS but I know a lot of it deals I know a lot of what what motive inspired her to do this project is the black church's um negligence and lack of response to um care for the communities that have been affected by HIV and AIDS most notably the black LGBTQ community so that's so she knows how Lloyd has been alienated when it comes to family when it comes to church when it comes to schools and she and her connection with him really in, empowered her to stand up against homophobia and really care and empathize with people that are in the community. So let me see if there's anything else that was noted in the introduction. Yeah, she talked about um, stigmatization of HIV and AIDS and... That's pretty much it. I did underline something. Yes, yeah, she says here on page six, um, sexuality is a sign, a symbol, and a means of our call to communication and communion. Uh, this is the most apparent in regard to other human beings and other body cells. The mystery of our sexuality is the mystery of our need to reach out to embrace others, both physically and spiritually. Sexuality is who we are as body cells who experience the emotional, cognitive, physical, and spiritual need for in intimate communion, human and divine. And she quoted um, um, Christian ethicist James Nelson. So she's talked. She wanna and she wanna get into a discourse called this a sexual discourse of resistance specifically a black sexuality discourse of resistance to oppression so part one is titled the roots of black theological silence so getting into um the black church's um um lack of response to the hiv and aids crisis so she went into like the roots of how homophobia became and came into been motivated by the black church and not just homophobia but sexism and um sex negative messaging so um she talked about in chapter one is titled black sexuality a pawn of white culture so she went into um the stereotypes and uh, fetishization of uh, black people so she started off on how sexualization happens through the white gaze and exploitation. So she went into, uh, she referenced the Clarence Thomas and Anita Hill hearings. For those who don't know, Anita Hill is um, a black law professor who accused, uh, who, well, she didn't accuse. It's like she was um, approached by, by some people that were trying to screen Clarence Thomas, who is a Supreme Court justice, um uh for the supreme court position and and it turns out that she talk, talked about how he sexually harassed her she did all the he did all these things to her to violate her um her her um sexual autonomy and um this was uh and it's interesting now because of these recent Supreme Court hearings, which I think this was a perfect time for this video because of uh, what's going on with affirmative action, what's going on with discrimination of LGBTQ plus employees. And um, even with last year with how um, reproductive rights have been pretty much been limited in a lot of states in the United States right now. So it's interesting that Clarence Thomas is brought up right now and she talked about and Douglas was talking about how 
the the sensationalism of those hearings became about um this Jezebel who which is a stereotypical um which is a stereotypical image of black women and their sexual promiscuity and how it is uh and how Anita Hill is kind of like going into the Jezebel act like you're trying to ruin this man's life because of your your reasons for like you did this to yourself and all that stuff so it's it's a lot of victim blaming that was going on in those hearings and lo and behold Clarence Thomas um got confirmed in the Supreme Court even with um um Anita Hills um being being violated so that is and that also brings into um OJ the OJ Simpson uh um trial and how it's another kind of fetishization and sensationalism of a black man's um relationship with sex sex and sexuality in regards to his attack to uh, in regards to attack of a white woman and it's i'm trying to think of what's the i'm trying to think of what's the stereotype that about um a a black a black man that's that's ape that's ape like and stuff like that. So that's that a lot of that is rooted into the European um settlers that were visiting um Africa and how they described Africans as primitive savages, ape like, and the narrative that that the OJ Simpson was trying to portray is that this is another um african that's acting wild because a white woman uh was being was being um attacked so um there's a lot of things to say about that child i will say that <laughs> but um douglas was going into how is is there's always a uh type of critique when it regards to black sexuality with those examples and she went into how um de demonizing black sexuality is pretty much part of white culture like if you go into the media and um literature and history and how um Black people and sex as not has not there's not been a good relationship between them because when you talk about the rape of enslaved people and you go into um some purity culture due to religion and things of that sort that um is like a blurred line when it comes to black folks um and and all of that has been used to justify black inferiority because it's like these, these, um, it's a lot of, um, what's the, what's the word? Um, sex shaming when it regards to, um, to people that were enslaved. So the Jezebel, there's the Mammy, there's the Sambo, and there's the Bucks and all of that, um, originated from in enslavement and not even just enslavement a lot of that is like perpetuated through m images in jim crow um and things in the media so um let me see if i actually highlighted something that stuck out Yes, yeah, she said here, white culture with its secretion of white supremacist values and ideology serves as a safeguard for a white racist patriarchal hegemony in America, which so all of these is supposed to be like a form of control. So she mentioned this this person named Michelle Foucault. I don't know how I'm, I think that's how it's pronounced and how it's an exercise of power when it regards to sex and sexuality that um, white supremacy has been using. So, um, it was also talked about on this page, she talked about the same, the same person, Foucault. Foucault says, when there is power, there is resistance. 
A relationship of power depends on a multiplicity of points of resistance. These play the role of adversary, target, support, or handle, and power relations. These points of resistance are present everywhere in the power network. Hence, there is no single locus of great refusal, no soul of revolt, source of all rebellions, or pure law of the revolutionary. Instead, there is a plurality of resistances, and it is doubtless the strategic codification of these points of resistance that makes a revolution possible, somewhat similar to the way in which the state relies on the institutional integration of power relationships so when there's a control of of the power when it regards to sex there's going to be eventually some resistance and this is what motivated douglas to say we need a sexual discourse of resistance and is that the main thing i think she also she also went into um how the Bible um, referenced the, the discourse in the Bible when it regards to sex, which, yeah, there's a lot of things that can be said about that. Um, yeah, she said here, and on page 25, pre-Christian Hebrew life showed little tendency towards seeing the body as an impediment to spirituality. Sexuality apparently was appreciated as a gift from God, as evidenced by the Hebrew scriptural references to persons as flesh rather than spirit, or by the celebration of sensuality in the Song of Solomon. Yet Christianity gradually became influenced by those aspects of Greek thought that denigrated the body and fostered a profound split between the body and the spirit. The spiritualistic dualism was primarily crafted by Platonic and Neoplatonic thought. So a lot of um, these sex negative interpretations came from the came from uh, these people that were studying the Bible and reading it, and it became and it, it like reaffirmed their biases when it regard regards to how people should. Of navigate sexuality in a way that is supposed to be um, perfect for God. So, and that, and that, and then that's that case. And she also went into um, um, she went, yeah, she went into. Augustine's views on sexuality are generally characteristic of early Christian attitudes. St. Thomas Aquinas, for instance, proposed during the late Middle Stages a threefold standard for sexual acts. They must be done for the right purpose, which is procreation, with the right person, one spouse, and in the right way, heterosexual genital intercourse. Even during the 16th century, the Protestant Reformation did not redeem sexuality as it remained singularly identified with the lustful urges of the body. Martin Luther, for instance, believed that sexual activity was a strong, lustful human urge. Marriage for him was a necessity so as to allow for some control response to this libidinal urge. So for those of, the, those of us who grew up in a church, that's like um, how the respectability politics of sexuality came, where you have to, you can't have premarital sex. You had to have sex with um, the opposite sex. Um, you had to have you can't procreate yeah you can that's like the godly way of life so a lot of these um messages became came from those historical um moments and i think that is oh no she also went into women's sexual deviance which is on page 28 let me see if i yes yeah, right here. She says right here, yet the portrait of women in spiritualistic dualism is not strictly one-dimensional. Women have also been cast as chaste virgins. Given women's roles as women, mothers and wives, it would not do to cast women as irrevocably evil. Such an evil being would have corrupting influence over children and a certain seductive power over men, as Eve was thought to have over Adam. Which I would see, I see how the Jezebel trope um, came into being because because uh, a lot of the sexism is because of how Christians interpreted the way Eve, Eve was handling um, the forbidden fruit and all that. Therefore, women were further caricatured by a denial of their sexuality. The perfect woman was cast as a combination of Mary, virginal, pure, and submissive, and one willing to produce children for her man. 
And as we will see in more detail later, while the women may always have been relegated to the lower half of the dualisms, it is certainly not only she. This Western Christian tradition has also influenced white cultural disposition toward black people. And that is it for chapter one. So chapter two goes more and deals more into the stereotypes, false images, and terrorism that um, the white, white, because of white culture and whiteness um, has put harm to the black community. And she went into the hist historical roots about it. She went into how Europeans encountered with Africans and compared Africans to apes. And she also mentioned the story of Sarah Bartman. So for those of y'all that don't know who Sarah Bartman is, I recommend going into my Fearing the Black Body video for Sabrina Strings. Sarah Bartman is a South African um, fat black woman um, during enslaved during um, the transatlantic slave trade. I think she went. She was in Germany, and a lot of what got a lot of attention that she's garnered is because of her size and her body. So it's a lot of spectacle shows because because of how of how fat she is. So there there was a lot of tr um, mistreatment towards her. There was a lot. It's like a it's like she was in a circus because so she made a lot of she got a lot of attention because of how she was shamed, how she was um, mistreated, how she was abused. And that goes along with um, anti-fatness, misogynoir, and misogynoir. And, and that also gets into sex shaming um, of black women. So black women are like always the scapegoat when it comes to um, sex, shaming mo sex shaming messages. So like I said, there's the Jezebel, um, which is... Um, which is a um, hypersexual um, black woman. Um, and then there's the mammy, which is a undesirable asexual um, woman. So the black, the white people don't like the Jezebel, but they love the mammy because the mammy takes care of their kids. Um, yes, they do want to, they want to have control of the mammy, but the mammy is, is conforming to white standards of, of, operate of of society so and let me see if there's anything else that stuck out in that in that um section um yes there's the violet buck violent bucks um the violent bucks are is so basically if you, that's like a punishment is to talk about how the way slaves get punished so if you like ran away, if you disobeyed um, the slave masters, they castrate you, um, the slave owners, or they lynch you. So it's a lot of um, messages when it comes to um, black men and their penis and the stereotypes when it comes to, to that. So they castrate black men to violate their their manhood and the mask and their masculinity to make them feel less of a human being and trying to reinforce those power relations of white supremacy. So it's it's um um sorry trigger warning of abuse and violence and slavery references, but yes, those were a lot of the punishments that in regards to violating black, black sexuality for the sake of white supremacy. And then there's the continued attack on black sexuality when it became the, when it, we got to the mammy who be taking care of everybody, the white children and her children. They even breastfeed um, the white children. And now we got to the matriarch of families and if you all go back to, and speaking of the Michelle Wallace Black Macho to the Myth of the Superwoman, go back to that video because I mentioned the Moynihan Report. And the Moynihan Report, for those who don't know, is um, by this politician by, I think it's Patrick Moynihan. Um, he put out this report onto like why the black family is struggling. And a lot of it is because there's, because black single mothers are raising their sons by themselves. Um, there's no men in the house, and a lot of that is like not taken into consideration the context and nuances of racism and um, 
uh, masculinity. So she she tackled how it's another way of trying to um, demonize black sexuality and shame the Jezebels from trying to live their lives. And, and the Jezebel trope turned into the welfare queen, which we all know about the welfare queen. That's how Ronald Reagan um, took advantage and made a part of his political campaign to become president. Um, and then that trope also lied into the Clarence Thomas and Nita Hill um, hearings, O.J. Simpson being the violent black man and how it reaffirmed those uh, white supremacy um, um, perspectives. And I think that's the gist for that. Yeah, so that is chapter two. So we can get into chap into part two, which is the impact of the white cultural attack. And chapter three is titled The Legacy of White Sexual Assault. So um, she went into pretty much the impacts of, of colonialism and whiteness and how it's making us have a bad, a negative relationship to sexuality. And not just sexuality, but just um, how we treat each other as human beings because of the individualist and capitalist of um, forms of operations. And she said in um, this section title, More Than a Reflection of White Culture, she talked about um, the enslaved views on premarital sex and marriage and how... Um, because black people weren't treated, were weren't considered human back then, we had to f form our own wedding ceremonies, marriage ceremonies. So that's how jumping the broom came to be about because they weren't allowed into those white ceremonial spaces. And she talked about how it socialized and how there was a lot of nuances because of premarital sex because of. Um, and there was a lot not and within the black community it's not a lot of shaming in regards to that because because people weren't didn't have autonomy because they were raped or sexually assaulted by their slave masters so i think back then people pe people black communities were more empathetic towards people that were sexually violated so it's like why have how why have we lost our roots and and connections towards each other. Because even today, when it comes to like R. Kelly or um, um, Russell Simmons and people that um, sexually violate black women, um, we still need to go back into caring for each other because th that was our way of survival. And making us go against each other in these victim blaming tactics is what's drifting us apart. And and I think that was the gist of that section. And then she she got more into how she described a sexual discourse of resistance. So for a sexual discourse of resistance, she's not even just talking about like uh, consent and all that stuff. There needs to be a need for a comprehensive dialogue when it comes to sex and sexuality. So when it comes to of uh, um, having how to have safer sex or something like that, we need to have those type of conversations. And even without and throughout history, there's a lot of um, of black history when it regards to sexual liberation movements. Hence, um, when it comes to music, there's the Dirty Blues, um, there's gangster rap um, and hip hop. So. And those were like examples of like how there's been ex forms of expression when it comes to um, b of pleasure and um, sexual autonomy and things of that sort. And and that's something that we're even that's that's still going on today. And how a lot of sex. A lot of the sex shaming um, and respectability politics puts a lot on our self-esteem as black people because when it comes to like saying like um, m masturbation or something of that sort, uh, there's 
there's this shaming when it regards to pleasing oneself. And like, if you're not in love with yourself and passionate with yourself that you care about your um, pleasure. So, um, and then she got into like self-love. So I would say if y'all read Adrienne Marie Brown's um, Pleasure Activism, I would say this is like the, 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 the Bible version of that book. Because it's kind of going into those lines of uh, what Agent Marie Brown was saying about um, having autonomy, having freedom to do, to give yourself joy and pleasure. And how, and Kelly Brown Douglas went into like the systematic way of how that's affecting our sanity and our, um, and our relationship with one's, with our wholeness and ourselves. And and then and she went into how there needs to be a mandate for a sexual discourse of resistance. So this is like a like a legislation that she's like it's like a call to action that she wants to see and see how this can affect the impact upon black self esteem, how it can affect black male and female relationships. In regards to um, gender and sex, and a lot of examples that she that she's seen, she pointed out like Spike Lee movies. Like if y'all seen um, do the um, she's got to have it. How that's kind of like okay, this Jezebel trope that Spike Lee is perpetuated through. Um, she's got to have it. It's being punished for being raped. If y'all seen the movie, and. And it's like, oh, so that's your messaging for the masses. And she went into how those stereotypes carried on to like John Singleton movies. Um, I forgot which movie she talked about. I think she did mention Boys in the Hood um, in here. Um, she also talked about um, Mo Better Blues. Yeah, she mentioned Poetic Justice and Boys in the Hood. Um, and... And then she talked about how those movies are considered the classics in black communities. But when it comes to like waiting to exhale and for colored girls and the color purple, there's a lot of um, animosity from black men about those um, movies because a lot those movies center black female empowerment at the ha uh, and and combating against black patriarchy. And even today, like with a new color purple that is about to come out later this year, there's like talks about how the color purple is like is is an attack on black community and the black man, and not going into like how patriarchy itself is attack is um uh, detrimental to the black community, and. And then she went into some more examples. She went into the Thomas hearings. She went into Mike Tyson's rape case, the Million Man March, um, and the idea of manhood and black power movement. So I'm thinking about um, the Black Panther Party and how a lot of the leaders were men, but a lot of the people that were carry the the movement on their backs and the majority of the members are black women and how this idea of manhood like the black man has to be the one that has to lead the community and it can't be a black woman because it's like racism first sexism another time so that's um how that's the way douglas was looking at it because because to be a black woman you really can't separate those two you're always going to be living in a world where racism and sexism are affecting you and 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 if you got to if you really want to go there racism and sexism are are inextricably linked cuz they all come from the same um power structure which is capitalism and colonialism and then she went into um how those go into the black spiritual cir circles so chastising of of unwed mothers so and how those unwed mothers perpetuate the Jezebel trope. So those Jezebels. And even with that, there is a, there is a history of a link in African culture between spirituality and sexuality, especially before colonialism. So let me see. Did I 
do um yeah, she said here, many African cultures long embraced the intrinsic connection between spirituality and sexuality. This was evidenced by their resistance to dualist, dualistic distinctions between the sacred and the secular, the soul and the body. There is no radical break in most African traditions between the spiritual and fleshy realms. Now, all that is of the earthly realm of is God's and is sacred. As Peter Paris observes in the study of African spirituality, secularity has no reality in the African experience. The human body and the entirety of the human being are viewed as part of the sacred, as part of the divine, including the human being as a sexual and relational being. This is why many African cultures did not view sexual intercourse as bad or evil, but celebrated the sacred part of life. So that goes into we really um, got a long way from like how it was it used to be before colonialism. And a lot of that is because of the way violence of colonialism, patriarchy, capitalism, and all those forms of oppression have put people in a way that's taken away their autonomy and marginalization and oppression of themselves and each other. So that is it for chapter three. So chapter four delves more into homophobia and heterosexism in the black church and the community. So when it comes to these typical sayings of these typical homophobic um, messages, like I can love the sinner, but not the sin. Homosexuality is an abomination. To be gay goes against nature. If we were supposed to be homosexual, God would have created Adam and Steve, not Adam and Eve. I don't mind gay people, but why do they have to be so vocal and pushy about their rights? Homosexuality is a white thing. Africa did not have homosexuals before Europeans went there. Homosexuality is detrimental to the black family, even though queer history has been here as long as we can, as long as human civilization, probably even before civilization, <laughs> but as long as humans been existed, um, queerness has been around. You can go back into... Um, how b before colonialism they were there were a lot of like gender wasn't really that much of a thing um back then so people so sexuality was way more fluid um before colonialism um i'm trying to remember what was what was it was there was a book by this anthropologist it's about like um brother wise or something like that like those type of things were a thing in africa before colonialism but uh as we get into homophobia and heterosexism she got into like how homo black homophobia became a thing because it's pretty much passed on from white supremacy and those understandings and she went into like how people interpret the Bible and had had these biases before they start reading the Bible about people and how that can um, form their idea of this is the way of life. This is how you should live for under God's eyes um, in order to get to heaven, because those other deviant ways of knowing of, of living is is um, deviant to God. So, um, she talked about, um, how a lot of scriptures are really talking about, like, pedophilia and stuff like that. So, not necessarily when it comes to consensual sex between two people. And, yeah, she went into how uh, Leviticus 18.22 and 20.13, John chapter 8, verses 3, 3 through 11, she went into like how really the only thing that the Bible really said is like bad uh, that's sexually relevant is rape, um, sexual assault, and infidelity. Um, so she went into really how those are really the ones that um, are bad. <laughs> so it's go. It's pretty much how it's pretty much like how um, you you just you just have a lack of knowing other people before you actually put out these messages out into the world and make systems out of it and create like. Um, forms of violence against them. So that's how 
queer queer communities had to go th- that's the hell what queer communities had to go through right now like there's a lot of um stigma towards them there's a the hiv aids crisis because people be saying like aids is god's punishment or something like that but now here we are in covid times where everyone is pretty much affected so it's like so what is this punishment for so it's a lot of um a lot of cherry picking and a lot of selective um a lot of selectivity when it comes to like who which sin which sin is not good in the eyes of god and which sin is like mm, it is acceptable but we can do something about it so it's it's interesting going into that type of space and and let me see did she go into that what else did she say yeah and she said like how the bible was used to justify not even just homophobia but racism and sexism classism ableism all a lot of those isms is come because of um how the way people interpreted um a lot of stories from the bible especially like the old testament and and how now it's like homosexuality is is detrim is the is the one that's detrimental to um black life when really if we're really looking into the details and the studies um black queer people are actually the ones that have been raising helping like raising families um they're the ones that if we really want to go there, uh, uh, the black church will not be the black church without the black queer community. <laughs> um, and um, and how it's like, how are all of these things supposed to be alienated against pe- uh, alienated to people? And they're the ones that are actually keeping things together. So not even just black queer people, just simply like black women. Um, um, black community leaders, um, and it's just it's just interesting how all these ideas are formed and how it's uh, and how homophobia is another way of of um sex shaming individuals. And that is it for chapter. That was chapter four. So part three goes into like, she's trying to conceptualize a theology of black sexuality. So chapter five is titled God Talk and Black Sexuality. And in this section, she talked about how there's like two, there's like different ways you're, you're going to re you're going to interpret the incarnation of God. There's a disembodied view and an embodied view. So, oh, I did a lot of underlining here. <laughs> yeah, because it was a, it was a really interesting section. So she said here, in the language of their own experience and using the Old Testament imagery of being a chosen people, enslaved men and women testified in song that they too were children of God, created in God's own image. Spirituals were filled with lyrics like these, we are the people of God, we are the people of the Lord. I really do believe I'm a child of God. Such testimony was quite revolutionary because it was a denial of white slaveholders' claims that blackness was an affront to God and that God, black people were not children of God. Black Christians still carry forth this radical affirmation of their intrinsic connection to God as they sing a song like, I got a robe, you got a robe, all of God's children got a robe. To corrupt, misconstrue, deny, and simply ignore black sexuality is a betrayal of Christianity in general and black faith in particular, especially since these dancers portend a distorted understanding of and diminished relationship with God. So it's like, if you're really going to follow, if everyone really, we don't, we have, really humanity is the way is really composed of people just living their lives whether they're living according to like what the bible says or they're not or they're not so um 
And she also says the message of God's embodiment in Jesus is unambiguous. The human body is not a cauldron of evil, but rather an instrumentality for divine presence. It is the medium by which God is made real to humanity, through which God interacts in human history. To accept that Jesus, the first century Jew from Nazareth, is God incarnate indicates that in Jesus, divinity and humanity are irrevocably united. So she's talking about shaming sex is like shaming god <laughs> it's like um we really have to look at the body in a way that is um really um freeing for people people can do whatever they want with their bodies um and people should feel safe and affirmed with the bodies that they have so, um, and the way they do, and the way they navigate with their bodies, because if we're focusing on controlling those people's bodies, we're really, um, taking away freedoms and that is ungodly. That's what she's saying. And she also said here to manifest our loving relationship to God is to be in a loving relationship with God's creation. This is a fundamental aspect of what it means to be created in the image of God. Women and men who choose to reflect the the imago d in the world are agents of loving relationships with God's creation. The writer of First John puts it this way: "Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love." Sorry, let me read that again. Um, to manifest our loving relationship to God is to be in a loving relationship with God's creation. This is a fundamental aspect of what it means to be created in the image of God. Women and men who choose to reflect the Im imago d in the world are agents of loving relationships with God's creation. The writer of 1 John puts it this way. Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. God is love and those who abide in love abide in God and God abides in them, which is in 1 John um, chapter 4, verses 7 through 8. So that's what Douglas is saying. That should be the foundational way of living as a Christian is to love one another, to love your neighbor, be in community with each other, not focusing on these little things that make us different. Um, cause to have love and support for one another is the way that we should be living and anything of that sort is really the sin, is the ultimate sin. And that is, that goes into detrimental to sometimes what's being preached in the pulpit. And that is that on that story. Um... So now we're going to go into what she and what she says is the a disembodied view of the incarnation and an embodied view of the incarnation. So per, bear with me. This is a long read. Um, so first, they do not take seriously the contextuality of God's revelation. She's talking about people that take the Bible in a way that it should be forced, should be based on order and control and oppression. She said, first, they do not take seriously the contextuality of God's revelation. Disembodied understandings do not indicate an awareness that just as a revelation of God reveals something about the context into which God enters, so too the context reveals something about God. The context itself is revelatory. That is, the God of Jesus Christ is one whose radical disclosure is best understood from the vantage point of the marginalized, outcast, and oppressed in society. The black enslaved witnessed to this fact as they sang, poor little Jesus boy, born in a man manger, world treat him mean treat me mean too as we shall see later to take seriously the context of god's revelation and jesus clearly has direct implications for how gay and lesbian persons are viewed in church and society and second such disembodied interpretations do not take seriously that it was through the very body of jesus that god's humanity was expressed through his body, Jesus was able to interact in the world and to enter into relationship with others. Moreover, that Jesus touched, healed, and raised the dead indicates his own respect for the bodies of others. The body can be a vehicle for divine presence and the means by which human beings can communicate agape. The body is the physicality of sexuality, that which signals the potential for one to the physical 
to the, to be authentically human and hence to reflect the image of God in the world. A disembodied approach to God's disclosure in Jesus subverts the very radicality of God's disclosure. It negates the significance of God's presence in human history by metaphysicalizing and mystifying God's revelation in Jesus. And what she's saying, these people that are having a disembodied view of, of God are these Christian evangelists, the, these um, uh, people that are enforcing patriarchy that are enforcing sexism racism homophobia all these oppressors the oppressors are the ones that are this are sinning they're the ones that are um taking god's foundational um messaging in a way that is ungodly and when she said when it since that's the disembodied view the embodied view is to reiterate the incarnation indicates that god isn't embodied in human history through jesus christ and as such is an intimately active presence in the lives of women and men a sexual discourse of resistance seeks to protect this historical realness of god's revelation in jesus such a view demands a theological understanding of the body. It does not compel an idolatrous worship of the body, but it does compel an appreciation of the body as indeed the very temple of God, as the medium of God's love. It is by becoming embodied that God was distinctly revealed in human history. Moreover, it is only via bodies that human beings can come to know and be in relationship with one another. We reach out to one another with our bodies and we accept one another as embodied. So it's... It's we re our bodies are the ways we live our lives. So why should we shame each other by the way we really use our bodies? We should appreciate and love our bodies and other people's bodies the way that they should be appreciated. And here she's also saying, and when it comes to passion and how it's described, she says here, God's passion suggests a broader understanding of human passion. Human passion must be seen as more than lust or desire for sexual activity. Audre Lorde, for instance, describes it as an erotic force. She says, it is, a, it is an assertion of the life force of women of that creative energy empowered. And Baptist minister Patricia Hunter calls passion unquenchable thirst for what which is not yet. Passion is that determined desire to know ourselves and others completely. Passion is that determined desire to know ourselves and others completely. Passion is our soul's desire for harmony born of justice. And you can look at passion in a multitude of ways when you're passionate for what you want to do in life, whether you're passionate for the ones you're lo that you love romantically, platonically, and familially. And she also says here, it is that divine energy within human beings, the love of God, that compels them toward life-giving, life-producing, and life-affirming activity and relationships in regard to all of God's creation. So while passion certainly encompasses the biological production of life, it means more than that. It is powerful. Um, creative dynamism. It is a glimpse of God's perfect passion for life. Human passion is God's passion bursting f forth from the human being as an insatiable desire to foster life in all aspects of one's living. Such an understanding and appreciation for human passion as a glimpse of God's own passion demand an embrace of human sexuality. And one more, I promise y'all, I highlighted it. There was, it. This chapter was just so good. Um, human sexuality is a vehicle through which one's passion is expressed. It is a respectable for passion. It is a means by which humans can share in God's intense love for life. It is a create central factor in recognizing the human role in God's ongoing creative um, activity. So she's saying like that is just why are we um, refrain? Why are we trying to get a trying to? eliminates people's yearning for passion whether whether regards because like the way we view passion is like when we like people can say you should do what you love but capitalism doesn't necessarily give space for that in numerous ways whether that sex career your relationships your um and movements and stuff like that. So trying to eliminate passion is eliminating freedom and affirmation. And she also says here, when it regards to um, sexual discourse and authentic black faith, that passion is the reason we got the civil rights movement and abolitionism and abolition movements. 
She says here, in this regard, one can say that the religion of the enslaved bore witness to the true meaning of Christianity in a way it maintained the integrity of the radical meaning of Jesus Christ. A disembodied view of the incarnation, especially as it ignores the ministry of Jesus, allows for the compatibility of Christianity and slavery. Just as spiritualistic dualism, the progenitor of such a view, spawns sexist and racist views of humanity. An appreciation of God's embodied presence condemns slavery and other forms of human oppression for the way in which they contradict the very pr presence of God revealed in Jesus Christ. A black sexual discourse of resistance while clarifying the meaning of God's revelation in Jesus will basically highlight the life-sustaining and liberative strands of black faith grounded in a religious tradition at once African and Christian that affirms the goodness of human sexuality and all of its complexity. A love of one's own body is a fundamental component to saying a loud yes to God's profound and gracious, meaning freely given love. The radicality of God's love expressed in Jesus Christ means that God's love God loves our very own bodies. Jesus Christ clearly signifies that God loves us not in spite of or apart from our bodies, but that God loves us in our bodies as uniquely embodied creatures. Our bodies are the vessels of God's abiding love. To be able to love our own bodies is to be able to accept God's love for us. To be able to love our bodies is to not to know the full measure of God's love. It consequently means that we will not be able to share that love. So basically, the 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 saying we all know: if you don't love yourself, you how can you love your, how can you love yourself if you, if you don't love yourself, you can't really love others like that. And let me see: is that the and then she pretty much talked about reiterating the how forms of oppression are the real sins. Um, yes, yeah, she says like how that white culture is sinful is evident and alienates persons, particularly black people, from God as it thwarts human relationships. In this regard, both white and black people potentially participate in the sin of white culture. When a, white cult, when a white person remains silent in the face of white culture and reaps the benefits of that culture or nurtures and protects that culture in any way, even by denying its existence, that white person is fortifying his or her own sin. Likewise, the tacit refusal of the black church and the black community is, to engage in black sexual discourse signals black people's complicity in the sin of white culture. Silence in the face of sin is no less in the collusion with that sin. Specifically, silence on matters of sexuality leaves black men and women vulnerable to the spiritual as well as the physical Psycho psychological, emotional, and physical consequences of the white cultural attack upon black bodies and intimacy. And an example that I'm seeing is is her is her critique on the black church um, um, not responding effectively to the HIV and AIDS crisis because a lot of it is affecting not just um, people that are in the in queer community, but also people that are black. And not just black LGBTQ people, black um, cis het women, black cis, black and black people in general have been affected by the HIV AIDS crisis. So it's like because it's perpetuated in the media and um, it's affecting disproportionately people that are black and LGBTQ is the reason why there's silence on the issue. So she's saying that's the that's the real sin right there. And she also says here, this is this is going to be a lengthy one, another link. Like, yeah, this is a very, I really appreciated this chapter, y'all. Um, Douglas says, to identify sin as racism, sexism, white culture, and cooperation with such tyranny suggests two key points about a Christian perspective on sin and repentance. First, this conception of sin paralleling in some ways traditional understandings of sin that emphasize individuals who collectively and individually rebel against God stresses its social character to the extent that individuals and communities participate in these social sins. They too are estranged from God. Thus, there is an individual as well as a communal responsibility for violating the humanity of another and precluding his or her her or him from fully experiencing what it means to be created in the image of God. And second, repentance thus requires a total conversion for both the individual and community. In terms of the white individual and or community, repentance necessitates the complete rejection of white culture and an advocacy for that which advances black life and wholeness. This means, as suggested in chapter one, a radical dismantling of white culture and the oppressive white racist patriarchal hegemony that it seeks to protect. 
For black people, then, repentance requires an affirmation of their own blackness. This means utilizing all of the tools of a black culture of resistance, expressly a sexual discourse of resistance. To disrupt white culture's hold on black people, especially their sexuality, it also means resisting any temptation to collude with the powers of white hegemony, even when the temptation is the offer of privilege. And I feel like that's the motivating factor for why she wrote this book, because it's if we can't really pick and choose um, the sins that we're gonna really focus on and pick and choose the oppressions that we want to part that we want to get involved in because all of these things are intertwined with each other and is um an attack on god's human on the humanity that god um created so um yeah when she talked about how woman and womanist spaces um she said like how a lot of this um influenced womanist theology and a lot and part of it it goes into the loyalty um components of womanist theology so loyal to your community being loyal to community and the experiences of those who are the most marginalized um resistance to the assault upon the resistance to the assault that has been reflected upon the interlock system and structures of races, classes, sexes, and heterosexist oppression, and an appreciation for a person's wholeness, their entire myriad of experiences. And that is the end of chapter five. So this is the last chapter, um, chapter six, which is a sexual discourse of resistance and the black church. She's pretty much giving tips. This is a short chapter. She pretty much just gave like a list of things that the, that needs to be done to really like have an anti-oppressive uh, society. So what she, so what Douglasism suggests is saying is that we need to reunite the sacred and the, and the secular. We need to have an appreciation for the ordinary lives of individuals, no matter how um, different they are from each other. Um, we need to embrace um, black literature because a lot of black literature is a catalyst for sexual um, disclosure. So the way we talking about like in The Color Purple, um, Celie did not have love for herself and affirmation for herself when un until she got with Suge Avery. And because of the ways is, and it also went into the ways how the church has been harmful to Seeley and how it's been a liberating space for Seeley. And she also talked about black sexuality and popular culture, how there needs to be nuanced understandings and sex, sex affirmation messages being put out about it. And she also says that there needs to be an investment to black biblical scholars that are that did the training for um all of these discussions on um trying to link the sacred and the secular and there needs to be embrace of the black women that carry the church on their backs like the black church would not be with what it is without the black women that have been tithing that have been in leadership and all of that thing so there needs to be some empowerment of those experiences and she also said, like, we just need to have more um, embrace of um, sex positive and sexual liberation dialogue and religious spaces because a lot of that is making us um, uh, disconnected from people that have been harmed by the HIV and AIDS crisis and a lot of... And, her cousin Lloyd being one of them. So that was her call to action. And that is it for this video. So that is Sexuality in the Black Church, A Womanist Perspective by Kelly Brown Douglas. Um, I definitely recommend this book. Um, I will say it's, it's a lot of language that may not be... Uh, that people will have to get used to, but it's real. I it would say it's a very important book, especially for um, a field that does not have those type of conversations like that. So I found it interesting, like someone who um, 
got observed the HIV and AIDS crisis and how it really motivated them to really look at things differently, socially, politically, and sorry, <laughs> and how it is, um, and how communities are tr are interacting with each other. So that is it with this video. Stay tuned for another video, however soon that may be. I know it's been a while since my last video, y'all, but I really appreciate y'all st sticking with me and staying tuned to these videos. Again, thank y'all for the love. Um, I'm gonna try my best to, uh, put some more content for y'all out there but i'm glad that it gave me room to like really sit with myself um seeing um the feedback from the other videos the uh attraction that people have been giving those um and yeah and for those who have not followed my raisin souls um uh instagram it's at raisin souls Raisin as like a raisin in the sun and souls like the souls of black folk. That's how I came up with the title. <laughs> um, and make sure you follow my personal Instagram. I'll put them in the description box below if y'all inter that interested in my life. <laughs> but yes, um, y'all enjoy your day and stay tuned for another um, Raisin Souls content. Okay, bye.